Hey, so thanks everybody for having me today. My name is Steve Ritter. I'm the founder and CEO of Terralytic. And what we've brought to market is the world's first NPK sensor, also known as fertilizer. Um, the reason we did this when talking to farmers, one of the biggest problems they had and one of the biggest costs they have is the cost of fertilizer as an input. Oftentimes they do a soil sample once or twice a year. It's a snapshot in time that doesn't capture the trends and changes throughout the growing season. And what's the problem is they don't have any data during the growing season when they need that data the most in order to make fertilizing decisions. So as a result, oftentimes um, up to 50% of fertilizer is lost. Either it's washed away uh, into the rivers and streams or it's washed, uh, is it burned off as a greenhouse gas. So on the one hand, it's a huge profit drain for farmers. And on the other hand, it's a huge environmental concern as governments and communities are forced to clean up uh, fertilizer runoffs, algae blooms, and other things here. This is a satellite photo of Lake Erie, and as you can see on the, the ag side, all the algae blooms that kill the fish, that destroy the drinking water, are a huge problem around the world. So we deal with a lot of governments who want to use the data to both get preventive and see before big problems happen and help uh, farmers adopt better conservation practices, as well as with food companies who want to be able to show their consumers that their supply chain and their growers are good stewards of the land, growing healthy food in a healthy environment. So what we built is a LoRa-based soil sensor that connects back to our cloud where we provide analytics and an API for growers to actually see their data in real time. Right now, we transmit every 15 minutes, uh, and we're learning to figure out what the optimal transmission time is. But for now, every 15 minutes, the grower can look on his web or mobile phone and see in real time what's happening in order to make a fertilizing or irrigation decision. And the goal here is, through our pilots that we've seen so far, is to help growers save between you know, 15 and 45% on their input costs without harming their profitability, without harming their yield. Uh, and so the trials that we've done so far have been well received, and I'll talk more about those in a minute. So the sensor itself is about a meter long, and the things that we're measuring are the, the three major macronutrients in fertilizer, so nitrates, phosphates, and potassium. We're also looking at the pH, along with moisture, soil temperature, salinity, and we're doing that at three different depths, so at 15 centimeters, 45 centimeters, and 90 centimeters, to give a grower a good stratified view of their soil. And then we also measure things such as the aeration through oxygen, as well as the CO2 for respiration to give growers a good uh, understanding of their soil health from an organic matter perspective. And then above ground, there are, I'd call them poor man's weather stations where we're giving you local lumens, humidity, and temperature data for you know, a poor man's weather forecasting type service, which we'll improve on. And we've took a lot of time over the past couple of years to make these dead simple to install. So at the end of the day, growers don't have a lot of IT staff, they don't have a lot of things to, or it's staff to integrate and configure LoRa. So we built a lot, of, a, a lot of effort into making this thing as easy as digging a hole, uh, turning on the on button, and, and being up and running. And that's how it works. Uh, in most of our installs. So it's, it's very simple to install and get up and running and get your soil data right away. Um, the big question everyone asks is how accurate is this? And so throughout trials that we've done, uh, measuring our soil sample uh, real-time data with historical lab data, we're usually between three and five ppm different, which is almost nothing agronomically uh, when, when looking at our, our soil samples. And we'll tighten that up as we continue to learn through our pilots and apply machine learning to auto-calibrate some of our results and take into effect some of the environmental covariance. But uh, out of the box, it's a, it's a great solution to give you real-time data that's pretty accurate. We combine our hardware with an easy-to-use, what we call farmer-friendly interface. So it's context-aware, meaning we know what crop types you're growing. Uh, we can have the grower set alarms and alerts. So if they're looking at uh, low fertilizer, it could be fine for broccoli, but not good for apples. So the idea is we can provide a lot of context around what the soil data means and really help them take action based off the data. And then, as I mentioned, we provide the stratified view of the sensor so that as the roots are growing throughout the growing season, you can really match your nutrient levels, your moisture levels to where your roots are. So the idea is if your roots are you know, 18 or 45 centimeters down, but most of your nutrients are at six or have leached into the 36 inch range, you've, you know, you're not optimizing your crop yield, you've wasted money, and so 
being able to give these growers that data in real time is key for a, for a profitable farming decision making <laughs> process. And then we also spent a lot of time uh, building out an API. So we see ourselves as the NASDAQ of soil data, where we don't own the data. We built a lot of APIs where the data can be freely shared with any third party tool. So the idea is growers, if they're using John Deere or Trimble or Climate Corp as their farm management platform of choice, we'll enrich it with our soil data. And I'll talk about a few examples real quick on, on how these have worked with live customer pilots that we have today. So the first is through a blockchain partner of ours called Ripe.io, who what they call is the blockchain of food, which gives food companies, consumers, the provenance of a food from the time it was grown to the time it's served at, uh, into a restaurant. In this case, we work with a customer called Sweet Greens, uh, who just as part of their brand really cares about you know, the quality of their food, really wants to educate consumers about the source of the food. And a lot of it's done today anecdotally. So working with Ripe.io and the blockchain, we were able to actually digitally track all the events that happen throughout the growing season of, a, in this case, a tomato. So basically, Sweet Greens has a portal. They can look at the restaurant, the lot number, and see everything from the time it was harvested to the time it was transported to the time it was uh, served in the restaurant. But what we provide into the blockchain is all the environmental data that happens in, in soil. So the idea is any grower or any consumer could actually look up how was my food grown? Was it sustainably grown? And actually have the hard data behind uh, their products, which is a, a key trend that's happening across the food industry. And obviously, you know, showing the environmental uh, aspects of, of soil and, and the air and humidity as it's, it's been grown. We also have an integration that we launched last week at John Deere's Develop with Deere Conference, where today combines will just blanket spread fertilizer or spray based off recipes or calendar without really having any data about the soil to know if certain parts of the field are fertile versus others. And so they're often just throwing good money after bad where we can actually build heat maps of soil fertility to help the tractors automatically figure out what to spray or what to fertilize, when and where. So in this case, this is our normal UI that a grower would see. Um, through our API, we're able to import and export shapefile and boundary data. So in this case, we've exported our boundary data into the John Deere tool. This is what they use to manage their fleet of tractors and automate some of their operations. In this case, we can actually push the soil data into their tool so that they can control a tractor and tell it what to spray, when and where. And then the third use case we worked with Trimble on was to help automate precision irrigation. Oftentimes, a lot of the major uh, irrigation companies are selling high-end uh, equipment that is capable of doing precision irrigation or fertigation. In this case, each sprayer could, in theory, spray a different amount of fertilizer or gypsum or lime or whatever they're putting into the soil from a liquid perspective, uh, but they don't have the data in the soil to really drive the machinery. So in this case, we worked with Trimble in their SIS platform where they did a deep scan of the soil before planting to give us really good uh, soil, soil texture and content and slope and other aspects that we import into our platform to be able to figure out both where to place probes as well as uh, use that proxy data to start to tell uh, each sprayer how much inches to add or how much centimeters to add per hour as it's passing over a certain part of the field. And then we took this uh, typical circle into 500 polygons. So even within one circle, as you're passing over a certain part of the field, we actually tell it to spray you know, 50 centimeters per hour and the next part could be 100 centimeters, all based off the real-time soil data that we're looking at. And they also apply a lot of gypsum in the soil to change the pH. But one of the problems they have is they don't know if it actually made a difference. So being able to provide that back to their SIS platform was key for, uh, for them to make better decisions. The other thing I liked about this, um, oftentimes, as you probably heard, you know, gateways are a challenge in ag. It's hard to find places with sources of power. Usually you like to get them high so you can get a really good range, but there's often not a lot of, of uh, uh, poles or powers out there to really get coverage. So in this case, the farmer had a good machine shop Inside his center pivot, he actually gave us access to his power. He built a little uh, you know, station for the lower gateway. And so even though we didn't get high, it was enough to cover the entire crop circle, which is 160 acres. And then working with other companies like Lindsay, who obviously would provide flow metering, uh, tank monitoring, the energy management of the actual center pivot, we're able to get about 30 different sensors on one, one platform for a low cost uh, without having to worry about, about the coverage. 
So, you know, we've been in pilot for about a year. We have global clients around the world, everyone from family farms that grow 100 acres of strawberries in California to large conglomerates like Pepsi uh, or Cargill who have, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres of, of plantation or suppliers that supply them. Or we work with a lot of governments who want to use the data either for compliance reasons, as in New Zealand, where they actually regulate nitrogen, like some car countries regulate carbon, or for conservation practices where governments can get data and use that in partnership with the grower to help them become more profitable by using less fertilizer while improving the soil health and the ecology as a whole. Um, and then last but not least, we've, kinda, we've tried to drive the price close to zero as possible. In this case, we started out with a $500 per sensor per year charge which is all in. Uh, the grower could buy a pack of 10 sensors that would include everything we talked about. So they get the lower networking, the gateway, the bandwidth, all the software and API support they need to you know, use the software as is or integrate into their workflow. Uh, and so we've, we've had a lot of demand uh, because it's an instant ROI year one, uh, given that we can save them you know, hundreds of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars per year on their fertilizer costs. So with that, I'll, I'll pause here. We may have time for one or two questions, or, uh, sure. So any questions you have, I'm happy to answer. There's one over there. Yeah, we have another one over there. And my microphone started working again as well. <laughs> there you go. How many sensors would you need per field? Like, what's the sort of interval? It it depends on the crop type. So high value crops like wine, nuts, and berries usually get a sensor every one to 10 acres versus broad acre, corn, wheat, and soy may get them every 30 to 50 acres. And then the real broad uh, dry cropping such as canola or palm oil may get them every uh, 50 to 100 acres. So it really is crop specific and how they manage their, manage their fields if they're zone, soil zone based versus grid based. Yeah, here. Uh, about NPK measurement, aren't you afraid that um, the results you, you get may be too closely related to the moisture? I mean, you're probably measuring ions. Yes. And uh, would you get a reliable uh, uh, measurement, although the, the uh, variations of moisture may be important? Yeah, so we've calibrated the soil as it goes from zero VWC to 50, and we use that to error correct for ions in the soil. So we don't over calculate if the water is really moist versus if it's dry as a bone. Yep. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, like, I just had one question, which was, what would be the main challenge for you? Was it building the hardware, as in the sensor, the coverage of the crop, or was it uh, the data intelligence behind it, like how to make the data intelligible for the, for the farmer. So for us, we spent two years in stealth, spent millions of dollars, hired you know, uh, eight PhDs. So for the first two years, the challenge was just getting the sensors to work as advertised. Uh, when we first started the company, we thought we would have to provide the actionable insights for growers to take, but what the market told us is they don't actually want us to tell them what to do. They just want trustful, reliable, accurate soil data that can be pushed to the right agronomist or pushed to the right tool where it will make the decision. So we actually stay out of that, out of that box. We don't get in trouble. And we don't have the trust of the, the grower anyways to make those decisions. OK, last question. Um, if you look into the future, like so let's say five years from now, it's, it's 500 a year now. Moore's laws coming around. So yeah, you, we improve. We find out new stuff. Where are you in five years? Yeah, so we're working with a lot of large major companies in India where they want to deploy between 10 and 100, sorry, between 1 and 10 million sensors continent wide so that each grower can have their own sensor. Uh, and then we're working with a lot of companies in Africa where they also want to cover the entire continent. So as, as we get to those 1 to 10 million dollar volumes, maybe we get down to 100, maybe it goes closer to 75 per year. Um, to support some of the local smallholder farmers that can't afford you know, a larger $500 purchase this year. Okay, it's great, thanks. Will you be around this afternoon for people who want to talk to you? Yeah, absolutely. Any booths you're standing or just walking around? Just walking around. Just walking around. Maybe we put a sensor on you, that would be easier. <laughs> okay, <laughs> see you later, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah.